Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Richard. I'm a third year PhD student at UC Berkeley in the RISE lab. And the primary focus of research right now is hyperparameter tuning. So I'm going to be talking really quickly today about um, hyperparameter tuning for specifically deep learning workloads. And to motivate kind of the, the whole premise of this talk, if you've stepped outside of your door at any time this year, you know that everyone and their dog is excited about deep learning. And the reason why this is, is can be attributed to the recent successes in fields such as language processing, robotics, and computer vision. And as a programmer, this is great because it has also driven the development of nice, easy, fun-to-use frameworks. So, so let's first take a look at a function we have here. This is a typical program stru structure for a computer vision task. And so if you look very clearly here, um, is within three lines of code, you can construct a model. Or this is high level, but you construct a model, you create your optimizer, and you iterate over your data set using the optimizer to update your model. So this is pretty simple. But really, there's a dirty secret here, which is that or there's a couple of dirty secrets. First of all, the training process is going to take a lot of time, so so that's going to be bad. And then you're also using a, likely using a GPU or multiple GPUs because otherwise it's infeasible to do, and this is going to cost you a lot of money. And the final biggest dirty secret here is that that every abstraction here actually has plenty of configuration knobs, which we're going to call hyperparameters. And you're going to want to change maybe the, the architecture of your model, adjust the learning rate and momentum, or even change the way you pre-process data. Now, the fact of the matter is that if you for a lot of these problems, um, if you have to optimize, you, you'll have to optimize your hyperparameters. And this can seriously affect your performance, often in unintuitive ways. So here on the screen, for example, there's a common deep reinforcement learning task uh, for control that's plotted with different hyperparameters. And unexpectedly, the smallest model works the best. So this is weird, and this is bad, because what this means is that there's three goals, and they're all kind of like in tension with each other. You want to maximize performance, you want to minimize the time spent, and you want to save money. So this kind of sets up the premise of today's talk. We're going to be, talk we're going to be overviewing a couple of techniques that people have come up with to deal with these issues. So, there's going to be five main techniques that we're going to be covering today. So obviously, we're going to talk really quickly about the, the basic grid search and random search. And, and Bayesian optimization might also be a staple for this crowd. Um, but we're also going to be talking about bandits, uh, specifically Hyperband and Asha, which, were, uh, which are kind of like modern techniques for hyperparameter tuning developed at UC Berkeley. And then population-based training, which is a sort of a deep learning specific technique for hyperparameter optimization developed at Google DeepMind. So uh, again, some of these techniques are kind of applicable to the standard machine learning regime, but um, some of these techniques, such as hyperband population-based training, uh, have much more significance in the deep learning regime. So uh, real quickly, I'm going to be using this maybe like uh, this term uh, trial, and that's going to be um, sort of specif specifying like one configuration evaluation, uh, just in case people don't get lost. So let's start with grid search. This is a very simple and standard technique for evaluating multiple hyperparameter values. And even though this may seem naive, there's a couple benefits. So again, the so TLDR of this is that you take a cross product of all possible configurations and you have a list of values across different dimensions. So the, the benefit of this is that it's very easily parallelizable. And also, it provides a lot of insight about how your hyperparameters affect each other. And this is very important in cases such as research. Now, uh, the problem is that if you're simply trying to optimize your model accuracy, this technique is actually very, very inefficient. So, so here's, here's some intuition why. So let's take a look at this graph right here. Um, there's a, a very standard graphical representation of why grid search can, be, uh, can fail to be a good tuning method. So on the left-hand side here, we have a grid, grid search that uh, fully misses the optimal point of the um, or even close to the optimum point of this, what we call this important parameter, which is shown on the x-axis. And random search, which I'm going to talk about next, is able to provide much better coverage across the different hyperparameters in exchange for this sort of like structural analysis that you get and interpretability that you get from grid search. 
So let's quickly talk about random search next. At a high level, so you basically just sample configurations um, or uh, over a set set distribution over and over again. And users are it's up to the user to specify the distribution. There's a couple benefits for doing random search. So as mentioned previously, uh, it provides better coverage than grid search, and also it is easily parallelizable. So each since each of these evaluations is an independent sample. Now, it turns out in high dimensions, it's actually very, very hard to beat uh, random search. Now, now, the problem with random search is that there's, there's still quite a few things that we can do better here. And after all, you're trying things at random. So one obviously, obvious thing that you can do here is that maybe, maybe, just maybe, you can use the prior information from the evaluated training runs from previous runs to guide our tuning process. Well, so it turns out this is what Bayesian optimization does. And, and at a high general rate, uh, gen in, in general, this is what model-based optimization processes do. So, so this is a very high level overview of Bayesian optimization. So um, without diving into too many details, uh, so like here's, here's a very rough um, abstraction for what you would typically use for a Bayesian optimization um, algorithm or library. So what, what you do is you make, construct an optimizer that is um, aware of the search space. So here we have these bounds of um, the low value and the a high value for both learning rate and the layers. Now what we will do is over the course of some number of samples, we will sample from the optimizer to get a, a configuration. And um, the configuration is going to have some value for the learning rate and the layers. And we're going to then train a model using this configuration to get a final score, such as a validation or a loss. So then we pass this information back to the optimizer, and then we resample from the, we tell the optimizer to provide another sample configuration. So, so the optimizer will then use the information from prior results to generate a new next point um, to sample within the space. And ultimately, this will um, this aims to optimize um, a, a a given score or accuracy or value. And um, so, so this is a very high level abstraction. I'm not going to dive into the mathematical details. And um, and but there's a lot of open source libraries that provide exactly this abstraction. And most famously, you might have heard of something like Hyperopt. Um, but as you can see, there's a couple benefits to this. Um, but one thing to note is that Bayesian optimization is an inherently sequential process, which means that the, the benefit of this, like using prior information is dependent on these prior trials. Um, so, so what this means is that um, if you want to parallelize this, which you actually can given recent um, research, um, you can sample multiple points at once but the benefit of this parallelization actually decreases significantly as you add more workers. So, so, so this is nice. Um, we can we can parallelize Bayesian optimization now, and we can also use utilize uh, this prior information. Now, there's still some some room for improvement. Um, so, so, so by taking a look, let's take a look really quickly at what a tr typical training curve looks like. So. We have this graph of uh, training run inaccuracies. And there's a lot of models in this graph that are simply bad performers. And these might just be simple, simply different uh, hyperparameters that you're trying um, over the course of your training run. So, um, and this is going to be the case for all of the prior methods, including uh, grid search, random search, and Bayesian optimization. So keep in mind that Bayesian optimization, even though it ends up finding a better solution using prior information, it still needs to explore the search space. So you're going to end up with a lot of these like bad, um, bad training runs. So naturally, you might ask, well, uh, why bother wasting resources on trials that simply are not going to be good? And turns out there's a hyperparameter technique for you. 
So this is called, um, so this technique is called hyperband, which is an early stopping algorithm that aims to allocate resources to better performing trials. And let's quickly walk through some pseudocode about how this works. The high level intuition is that you compare relative performance for all of these training runs, you terminate the ones that are bad performing, and you continue the better ones for a longer period of time. And you do this in an iterative fashion so that, so eventually you have better trials that, 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 are bad compared to its relative other performers and you're going to kill them and you're going to continue them for an even longer period of time. So let's take a look at the pseudocode. So we're going to first sample from the hyperparameter space. This um, Right now, for, for the purpose of actually the original paper, it just assumes you do random search. And so, um, so when the, the, as we're going to run the trial or we're going to run this training run with this hyperparameter um, configuration, so we're going to keep running until we hit this like pre-designated cutoff. So this pre-designated cutoff isn't actually when we stop the trial, but is rather when we evaluate the, the relative performance. So if the trial and the performance is in the top fraction, which is user specified, but usually one third um, of the trials at this training iteration or epic, then if, since we are one of the best, we're going to keep running it. Now, if you are not in one of the best, we're just going to pause you and we're going to let another trial start. Now, um, what's nice about this is that, uh, again, this is an adaptive method. So if you have a training run that, that may be, um, you know, uh, very, very, like, inefficient in the very, so very bad in the very beginning, then, then we, will, we will be able to terminate it really quickly. So one thing to know here is that there's actually even recent advances that have made hyperband capable of being combined with Bayesian optimization. And since hyperband is very easily parallelizable, this can increase its efficiency even more. So, so now, now, given all of this, I can use an early stopping method with an Bayesian optimization method. So this gets you very, very far already. Now, now what's next? What's next in the deep learning world? Well, turns out, in deep learning, hyperparameter schedules matter a lot. So what this means is that we may change the value of the hyperparameter, um, such as learning rate and momentum, at, during the course of training. And this is actually required in a lot of computer vision tasks um, and even natural language processing tasks to get state-of-the-art results. So, 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 what, so what, what can we do to address this? Well, there's a technique from, from Google that, that actually is able to explore these dynamic hyperparameter schedules. So this technique is called population-based training, or otherwise known as PBT. It's a technique from Google DeepMind that addresses this issue. And the main idea is that you evaluate a population of hyperparameters in parallel. You terminate the lowest performers, and you copy weights from the best performers, and, and you mutate these best performers a little bit in replacement of these lowest performers. So, so let's take a look at this quick walkthrough. So I'm going to start off with, say, four different hyperparameter values. Um, so I have four members in my population. I'm going to then um, actually just run it until uh, for some set number of iterations. And then I'm going to evaluate the, the relative performance of each. But let's say the 0 0.4 value is the worst. So, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take the best performer, which I arbitrarily designated as 0.1, and I'm going to perturb the value a little bit to 0.15, but I'm going to copy the weights, the neural network weights, um, to that new perform to that new trial, which has the mutated hyperparameters. So note that this is effectively like searching over a hyperparameter schedule. So I'm going to keep running this, and say, um, say I, I, I find out that the 0 0.2 value is the worst uh, after a set number of epics, and then also 0 0.3 is actually performing very, very well. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill the 0 0.2 value uh, population member, and then I'm going to take the 0 0.3 and I'm going to perturb it, and so on and so forth. 
So again, the main benefits of this is that uh, for population-based trading, this is easily parallelizable, uh, enables you to search over schedules, and is efficient in that it early terminates bad performers. Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, this seems kind of hand wavy. Does it really work? So uh, turns out DeepMind ran this technique over multiple published algorithms, and including tasks in NLP, um, GANs, and deep reinforcement learning techniques. So, so they found that across the board, PBT was able to provide non-trivial performance benefits over the state-of-the-art published results for these, these papers that they had published earlier in previous years. So, so that's, that's, I think that, that's something that you have to have in your toolbox if you're doing some deep learning hyperparameter optimization. So now you might be thinking, okay, well, there's no way I'm going to actually implement all these algorithms. So, so uh, I'm here then to talk about Tune, which is a distributed hyperparameter search library from the Rise Lab that, that provides an easy-to-use interface for all of these um, algorithms that I've listed before. And then I'm going to walk into a demo that, um, that kind of shows you how to take use of these, um, these, these algorithms using Tune. So Tune is the joint work of many faculty members, uh, graduate students, and undergraduates at UC Berkeley. And uh, Tune is specifically a library that handles the execution of hyperparameter search. So it provides hooks to plug into different hyperparameter search algorithms while automatically handling the parallelism for you. So this means that, um, again, you don't need to, so you don't need to change your code if you're running on your laptop or on a big multi-GPU machine or across a cluster. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later and show you a demo. Um, so why is Tune special? Tune is built with deep learning as a priority. So this means that Tune uh, is built so that you can effectively utilize and spread your training across GPUs or multiple GPUs per trial. Tune also allows users to tune their model with any machine learning framework. And again, Tune is able to allow you to uh, run hyperparameter tuning at any scale. So that means from running one single process to running across multiple GPUs to running across multiple nodes, all without changing your code. Tune offers many algorithms for optimizing your hyperparameter search, including all the algorithms mentioned today. Tune also integrates with many open source hyperparameter search libraries, such as Hyperopt and Axe from Facebook, which means that you can transparently scale these search libraries across multiple GPUs and multiple nodes. Tune is also integrated in, into many open, popular open source projects, such as Allen Tune, which is an um, uh, open source tuning solution for NLP um, from the Allen Institute in Seattle, and Soft Learning, which is a popular RL library from UC Berkeley. Tune is also used in various organizations for tuning uh, deep learning and deep reinforcement learning models. So Tune also uh, out outputs uh, TensorBoard automatically so that you can take care of, you don't need to take care of um, uh, like instrumenting your code so that you can visualize things and allows you to um, analyze your existing trials to determine correlations and performance uh, across different trials and parameters. So, so with this, I'm going to then go into a demo. Um, let me change this real quick. So I'm going to demonstrate how you can utilize some of these uh, hyperparameter search libraries using Tune. And I'm going to show that it's, it's very easy to do. Uh, specifically, I'll be going over um, setting up a standard grid search. Then I'm going to be uh, in, uh, trying out a, um, a scaled out run with Hyperopt. And then, um, and then another what run using uh, Hyperband. So, so I have all these imports here. Um, and and I'm going to first just run this, and and then I have this training run in in PyTorch. Now what you see here is that um, this is we're going to be using um, a cluster of 16 GPUs across two nodes, and so um, I'm going to be using this uh, CUDA device thing, which which allows me to put my model onto the GPU. And, um, and so what you can do here in order to use Tune with this training run, which looks very standard, um, is simply to add this, like, this track log thing from Tune, 
which um, calls into tune to let it to to inform you about the the current training accuracy, and so Tuna was is gonna use this information to uh, determine relative performance and then terminate the existing training run if it's a bad performing trial. So um, so so let's let's just call this method, and um, what I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna connect to the ray cluster, which is um, kind of like what allows us to parallelize uh, tune across multiple nodes. Um, so tune is backed by Ray, which is a distributed execution engine in Python. And uh, Ray allows you to transparently um, parallelize uh, functions and classes across nodes. And you can find out more online. Um, but at a high level, this is what it's going to take to connect to the Ray cluster. And then um, I'm gonna check my cluster if my cluster is up, and I think it is. So yeah, so I have. Well, I guess I only have one. Node. Oh, I have eight GPUs, but I have two nodes. So, so what that means is that each node has four GPUs. All right. So, so I'm gonna start with grids. Uh, with actually a random search. Um. So. So what I have here is like a hyperparameter configuration, and there's gonna be a uniform. Uh, search over this this lower bound and the upper bound, and a log uniform search over this uh, lower bound and upper bound. And this is going to be like a base ten uh, log form log uniform uh, sampling. So to actually just use tune here, I can just run uh, with this command. So tune dot run. I'm going to pass in this uh, this this function. I'm going to specify that I'm going to want to use a GPU. So uh, trial equals GPU one. So so note that, that you can specify all sorts of different uh, resources, including memory and and TPUs and so on and so forth. And um, I'm going to pass in this configuration right here, which is going to specify my hyperparameters uh, search space. Uh, and I'm gonna set this verbosity in so that I don't have an explosion of um, things. So this should be it, and we can try this for a run. Oh, I forgot to run this. So, oh yeah. So right now, this is using one training run. Now, um, note that we have eight GPUs on, in our entire cluster, so we can actually parallelize this. So what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to increase the number of samples after this training run finishes. So let's say something like 20. So this is, this is done, and we got an accuracy of 0 0.65. Now, if we want to do a random search with 10, 20 different trials, we can just specify this. And um, this is too big. But you can see here, um, we, we've sampled all the configurations first, and we have eight trials that are running in parallel. And each of them is progressing at different rates. But you can see that some of them have better performances than the other. Um, and so, so after this finishes, then we can move on to um, Hyperopt, but actually, uh, I might just move on to that first uh, because it's going to take a while. But anyways, so um, so for Hyperopt, um, which is a again like a a model based optimization method which utilizes prior trials for for um, for 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 like better search. In, in in trials that that it determines to try next, um, it's going to require some um, some some specification here in Tune. So we're, it has its own uh, way of specifying trials or specifying a search space, and I've already written this here in advance. Um, but what what we can do here is we can say um, we can use the same Tune run configuration from here. And 
instead of passing in this configuration here, I can specify a search algorithm. And um, here, instead of this, I'm going to um, give this training run a name, which might be something like hyperopt. Um, this will help me differentiate um, the trials later on, or differentiate the, the, the plots later on, and the information that's logged later on. So in order to, to utilize the search algorithm, what I do is I just specify this hyperop search um, uh, constructor, which is provided with tune. I'm going to pass in a space, which is the hyperparameter search space, which is a native um, hyperop uh, construct. Then I'm also going to specify uh, the maximum number of uh, tra of, of um, concurrent trials that I'm going to run. Note that again, as 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 I mentioned before, the more uh, concurrency you add to the training run, um, the the worse it's going to do for this sort of model-based optimization method. So I'm going to just specify something like uh, like four, and then uh, for hyperop to kind of know which um, which accuracy to optimize on, I'm going to just tell it to optimize on um, who is this metric um, on the mean accuracy, which was specified, uh, which was passed in in the in the in the method for train mnist into the track.log, and then I'm going to pass um, I'm going to tell it to optimize this um, by maximizing. So, so just with this simple, just like one extra configuration right here, um, we're able to scale out hyperopt across um, two nodes for, with eight GPUs. Um, with eight GPUs, um, and you, you basically don't need to handle any of the distribution yourself. And so what's nice about this is that, again, as, 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 as promised, we have only four concurrent trials running at once. And um, and ideally, after some time, we'll see that um, that that more more the trials are going to get better and better. So, so the final thing that we want to take a look at is um, ASHA, which is um, also known as asynchronous hyperband. So I'm going to start typing this out as as the previous hyperopt um, training run is running. And then at the end, I can do a quick visualization over these training runs. So I'm going to take again this this um, this training, and I'm going to try actually just merging um, using both um, asynchronous hyperband and hyperopt at the same time. So this again allows me to be resource e efficient and, um, and optimize over a search space um, using prior information. So the way I would do this um, is just specifying this configuration or specifying a scheduler. And we call this a scheduler because it manages resources, but, um, but maybe a better like um, machine learning term is uh, like algorithm. Um, And the only thing I need to do here is just pass in uh, mode and metric, the metric and the mode. So, um, so there's four left that's running, um, and you can see that. Well, it's kind of hard to see, but it should get better and better. Yeah, but these are the last four that's running, and then we can maybe increase the concurrency for this because I don't want to wait too long. Um, but ideally, we can also use the asynchronous hyperband scheduler to further optimize our training. And um, yeah, um, but while we're waiting for this, uh, I can take some questions, I guess. I was curious about. Um, First of all, will you have this code available? Yeah, um, sure. Okay, cool. And then second of all, um, how easy is it to like not only tune 
model parameters, but like data pre-processing parameters and stuff with Tune. Is oh, that yeah. a thing? Yeah. So, so actually that's, um, we actually wrote a paper on that. Um, and we were it, using Tune and I can send, I can like post the repository with the, with the slides. Um, and this was like a published work at ICML last year. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, just to quickly overview this this hyper hyper uh, hyper op plus hyper band, you see that there's a lot of trials that it's, it's running for just a short period of time, um, and it's able to terminate really really efficiently because um, it finds out that there's a lot of trials that that just don't don't work very well. Meanwhile, it's able to find really high performing trials very quickly, um, and so. Um, Unfortunately, I mix, mixed up these these names, but, but maybe we can do something like this and run it again. I can do some visualization on TensorBoard. Any other questions? So uh, in one of the previous slides, uh, when, when you explained how PBT works, population-based thing, uh, there was only one variable. So, But in reality, there will be a set of variables which are performing good. And which one, how, how do you know which one to mutate? Right. Um, so, so this is a limitation of the algorithm. And generally what they do is they just, they, they downscope the scope, the number of uh, parameters that um, they evaluate. And since it's a Google paper, they also like run this at large scale. So, so it tends to be that like, um, that, that it works out for them. But, but right now this is just ongoing research. Uh, as to like how we can do better for that. All right, so I guess the last thing I want to show is um, technically we can visualize this um, on TensorBoard within the Jupyter Notebook. So or not. Maybe this is just the Jupyter limitation. Let's see. Uh, well. All right. Well, I guess there's there's nothing to show here. But like technically, you should be able to see like a uh, Jupyter like uh, a, like an in place plugin for a TensorBoard within within like a Jupyter notebook. Maybe it doesn't work for Jupyter Lab. So that's it. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, presumably, there's like some PyData channel for doing this. Is there? Uh, yeah, presentation plus like the uh, link to the GitHub. I can post like the slides with the presentation, or sorry, the a link to like this repository that I, with solutions right here, um, on like a separate slide in the presentation that I. I post online if that's. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it seems like you know all of these methods depend on the score being very smooth or pretty smooth over the hyperparameter space, and you know because it's very spiky, it's low chance that any of these methods would happen to land on a nice scoring spike. And so, do you know like do we or do we know in general if most deep learning algorithms have a pretty smooth scoring space, and so these would be relevant? Or yeah, I guess yeah, what's the general? research on that if you oh, know. yeah so I mean I think there's so speaking of like supervised learning and and even like unsupervised learning these those sort of like very standard um, like models for training tend to have uh, curves that you should be able to smooth out um, so if you take like a moving average they there it tends to work kind of well now where everything goes to like goes goes down like the black hole is like when you start playing with um like control out like uh so like deep reinforcement learning things so you'll see things that like go up and down and and it's it's a huge mess so so for those those things like um so like what google does because i mean deep mind is a reinforcement learning li like factory after all um they just like throw like 100 machines plus like population based training to to push their algorithms yeah. So after you've like 
uh, found your best model, what is the way to then like export the correct parameters? Yeah. So, uh, so right now what I've done here is I have this like save method that actually saves it within the right path. Now, um, now let's see. So, so I have this like analysis object and I can get like analysis dot get like best or logged or Yeah, so this should work, and so I have this logger, and and as as you saw, I appended the I have a path for the the model that I've saved here, but I can also ls I think uh, I'm not sure if I can ls. Wait, so logger. Yeah, so there's like parameters here, and then there's like a model that's already saved, and then there's also like you know tensor TensorFlow, TensorBoard things that that are not nice to me today, but yeah. In your experience, how does the Tune pipeline scale with the number of layers you have in your model? Oh yeah, so um, at some point like. If you're if you're adding like many many layers in your model, uh, like it, like this is just a general general notion of hyperparameter search, and um, it's gonna be hard for you to um, do optimization like any smart intelligent optimization there. The reason why is because like for these like um, these like like optimization libraries like like you it, like you can imagine like if I have like three layers. Um, if I range from like two to five layers or two to ten layers, and each layer has um, like some like I want to specify like the size of each layer, um, like you're not going to you're going to explore like the the ten like the like the size of the tenth layer very very infrequently as compared to like the second layer, and so like this is kind of like this like really construed um, space for like searching over things and um, and and for for those cases like. Uh, it it tends to be that like random search can like basically beat um, a lot of these like model based algorithms. Yeah. Um. So I wasn't sure if I saw this um, parameter in, but how how does this work with like a validation set, like a test and validation set? Yeah. So that's up to that's sort of like up to you to uh, specify within this this training run. So right now what we do is like we we ignore the training uh, accuracy, and uh, we do this test set, which returns this accuracy, like this accuracy value that we log and we use for our optimization. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So the high level idea here is that like we just like provide like very limited um, like abstractions for you to to do things and rather like push it all to the user for them to sort of set up their own training runs and stuff like that. Thank you, Richard Lau for leading us through the talk of hyperparameter tuning algorithms. That was really cool. You made it, gave us a walkthrough example. Um, everyone, please give them another round of applause.